Hey everyone, welcome to the Get Your Life Together Girl podcast, the ultimate blueprint of self-love and inner peace. I'm your host, Danielle Van. As a cognitive behavioral therapist, a life coach, meditation teacher, and author, I've spent my life studying and learning from the stories that make us human. It's my passion and goal to help you shift your mindset and create a lifelong revolution to help you reach your greatest potential. According to the World Health Organization, bipolar disorder is one of the top three causes of hospitalization in people aged 15 to 44. It's estimated that 5% of the world's population is on the bipolar spectrum, and of that 5%, only 1% to 2% of them are diagnosed. And while those percentages may sound small, with over 8 billion people currently in the world, we're talking about over 400 million people who live with bipolar brains. It's far more common than you think. In fact, in the U.S. alone, around 4.4% of adults deal with or develop bipolar disorder in their lives, and the numbers show that it impacts more females than males. I sat down with author and filmmaker Sarah Schley to talk about her experience with bipolar and how she has turned what she calls her brokenness into a blessing as she shares and serves with the world through creating knowledge and resources for those who believe there's little hope out there. In fact, that's the furthest thing from the truth. So whether you have a diagnosis, know someone who does, or it genetically is running through your family, this moving, impactful conversation is filled with understanding, truth, science, and community. So let's dive right in. The Get Your Life Together Girl podcast starts right now. Sarah, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. We're talking about something that I believe is gaining awareness in so many elements across the world, and yet we still don't know enough unless we are, you know, impacted, whether personally or through someone in our family or a loved one, friend, and we're talking about bipolar. You have a very close experience with this. And really have become an authority. So please introduce yourself. We want to know your story. And let's change the mindset about bipolar today. Beautiful. I love that. Well, exactly what you said. I I wrote my memoir, which is called Brainstorm from Broken to Blessed on the Bipolar Spectrum. um, Because, well, for lots of reasons, but the understanding of bipolar is so limited in our culture and in the world. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, like, if I asked you, have you ever heard of a bipolar spectrum? What would you say? I have, but most people have not. You have your professional cognitive behavior therapist. But in most rooms that I ask that question, you know, out of 100 people, three hands might go up. Right. Most people, when I ask them, what do you think of bipolar? What's bipolar? You know, most educated people, I just had a friend over who's a PhD and a master's in divinity and every other letter after her name. And Mm -hmm. she said, that's people who swing really high and, you know, they are irresponsible and they have, you know, they go off on spending sprees and maybe sex sprees and other sprees, and then they crash. And that's typically when people hear bipolar, what they think. But actually, they're just describing one end of what we now know as a bipolar spectrum. Right. Uh, that's the extreme end of bipolar one. The other extreme end is unipolar depression. And then there's all flavors in between. Yeah. Let's dive into that. But first, I'd love to know what it was like for you. How did you get into the place that you knew this is what you were dealing with? And then let's break down the different forms of bipolar Because what happens a lot of times is especially women will come into my office and they'll start talking and they have no true understanding of what's going on. They think it's a past trauma or it's hormones or or there's something. And the deeper we go, I'm like, "Ah, it's bipolar. Yeah. And there's such a stigma around that word. So what was it like for you and what was sort of the catalyst of understanding this is what I'm dealing with? Yeah, absolutely. And one of my goals is to crush the stigma. Yeah. Save lives and maximize healing. So for me, I was sort of a rock star kid. I was 21 years old. I was, you know, had a 4-0 in my very, you know, elite university. I was an athlete, million friends heading to one of the finest med schools in the country. 
Mm-hmm. And I had never experienced any kind of crash. Mm-hmm. And on all of a sudden, almost, you know, almost like what we call it, like clockwork on my 21st birthday, I had a severe depression. And mm-hmm. meaning that all of a sudden I couldn't get out of bed. I was afraid to see my friends when I was very social. I couldn't find my way to class. Literally navigation was confusing, even though I'd been there for four years. I couldn't add two plus three. And I was, you know, a calculus star. And it was this like devastating, terrifying spiral spin into like a living hell. And I was, I had no idea what was happening to me. And that was age 21. And then I'll just fast forward. It took 25 years, 25 Mm. years five psychiatrists and seven medications to get finally get me the diagnosis that saved my life, which is that I'm bipolar two, Roman numeral two. And that's bipolar without mania, which is super hard to diagnose unless you know what you're looking for. What a journey that must have been to go from what we call, and I'm doing air quotes for those listening, normal life, highly productive life to I literally do not have the wherewithal to get from point A to point B. How long did that span? Was it that entire time before diagnosis? No, no. for me, in my 20s were very rocky. I would have depressions that lasted nine months. Mm. Absolutely excruciating. And then I'd get better for whatever number of reasons, who knows. And then I'd go down, I'd be up for a little while, up being high functioning normal but high energy, my friends would describe me as high energy, which turns out to be part of a bipolar two diagnosis. And then another crash for nine months or so. And this went on for about a decade. And then I did a lot of, I learned a lot of alternative behaviors that we'll talk about later that are very functional and helpful around yoga and diet and exercise and mindfulness and all that good stuff. And that kept me going for a while, but ultimately for a series of reasons, I would have another crash And it wasn't until 25 years, like I said, in fifth psychiatrist, that I was diagnosed by someone who had studied the complexities of bipolar and knew what to look for. Mm, Frustrating. And yet it does speak to the tenacity that you have to continue to seek diagnosis and seek a a grounded space for yourself. You mentioned mindfulness. We'll go into that as many people that listen know I am an expert in mindfulness and believe that it is life changing when you put all of these practices in. We talk about Mm -hmm. the five masters that we just talked about, talk about it here a lot. Let's break down bipolar. Love for you to break it down. One, two, the spectrum. Let's talk about that so that people understand what it is we're really talking about. What you described in the beginning is exactly the mindset of bipolar, up, down, crash, depression. There is one, one, right? There's so much more to it. Yeah. I would love for you to break it down. Yeah. So ironically, bipolar one is easier to diagnose. Right. Because you can see those big highs and the dangerous Mm -hmm. behaviors and parent family can see it. They see the crash. They see the high. So that's much easier to, to diagnose. And it turns out, according to, I'll quote Dr. Roger McIntyre, Roger McIntyre out of University of Toronto, he says two thirds of the people with bipolar that he treats do not experience mania. Right. So the main thing is that I have bipolar without extreme mania. I have high energy. But as a result, it's very, it's difficult to diagnose because people, when they're feeling good, high energy, they don't go to the doctor. Right. It's when they can't get out of bed and a family member drags them to the doctor or right. maybe drag yourself to the doctor. Then the doctor looks at you, whether they're a primary care physician or a psychiatrist, and they see what? Listlessness, low energy, suicidal ideation, inability to get out of bed. And they go, okay, depressed. Let's right. write a script for, bi- for Prozac or Lexapro or any other SSRI, right? Uh, Unipolar depression drug. Well, it turns out for people like me with bipolar brains, those drugs can be dangerous. Right. They can actually make you worse. They Mm -hmm. often will trigger mania in someone with bipolar. And so so the main thing I think for people, the public to understand is that there is bipolar without mania. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Somebody's looked depressed and they're not responding to antidepressants or they're making them worse. Or they they get very depressed and other times they're high energy or they they may be a little bit in some cases if they're hypomanic they might be agitated or a little quick trigger temper not anything you necessarily would be looking for unless you knew to look for it 
Right. So, so bipolar two, in my case, I put the Roman numeral two for those not, not watching is sort of that classic pattern that has severe depression, lethargic depression, oversleeping, overeating, like inability to process thinking. Then at the other end, high energy. In terms of the spectrum, there's sort of lots of shades of gray in between. Right. That you really need to be an expert to, to understand. But I think the main thing to note is there's bipolar without mania. Mm -hmm. And that it doesn't matter. We can line up any kind of diagnosis. Doesn't matter what we're talking about. And everyone is going to present in a different way. So how does this impact you is really what we're looking for. So you described what it was like for you before you were diagnosed. What was the span of time when, after the first initial moment where things just changed for you at age 21 to the diagnosis? You said, I developed a lot of coping skills. Can you talk about that period of time? Well, the, the diagnosis I mentioned was 25 years later. Right. right? And so you want, you want to talk about the 25 years in between? Yeah. Yeah. And I, well, again, I think it would be very high functioning. People who would know me would think, wow, you know, this is like a corporate consultant who's traveling around the world and working with right. Nike and uh, Arlene Fisher and others. And they would see a high functioning person, you know, and over time with a healthy marriage and over time with kids, God bless them, they're 21 now. But what they wouldn't see, because I would almost literally hide in the closet, was one, I have my severe depressions and those would last for six, eight, nine months. And my husband in later years, once I, you know, once Joe was in my life, he would cover for me basically mm. in earlier years, there was nothing to support me other than thank God my family of origin, because we have this in generations prior. So they recognized what was going on, but they didn't diagnose it, didn't know what to do with it really, other right. than have compassion. My mother suffered from this, my grandfather. That's another key point, Danielle. It is yes. the most heritable genetic disease is bipolar. Absolutely. So if you have it in your family, tell your doctor. Mm -hmm. My doctors didn't ask what, you know, wow. they, they should know. So I think what, you know, that over time of that 25 years was high functioning crash, high functioning crash. In my case, you know, a year, two, three, four, then a nine month crash, a year, two, three, four, nine month crash. Everybody's different, like you said, right. but that's what it was for me. And bipolar two often have those longer depressions that are severely incapacitating. Right. So the fact that it says number two does not mean it's less severe. It's equally severe or worse, the right. depressions in bipolar two than one. Mm -hmm. And then, so like I mentioned over time, but here's where the psychological piece comes in, is that because my mother had this and I did not want to be that. Right. So as a young 20 something child, I was like, nope, that's not me. I'm not taking medication. Right. I'm not going down that route where you surrender to met to the world of, you know, white male doctors I'm going to be powered and I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm running and I'm swimming and I'm biking and I'm, you know, I'm doing yoga and I'm doing uh, massage and I'm eating macrobiotic and later I'm eating vegetarian and I'm in community. I got tons of support, which is all brilliant. And you need it if you're bipolar or pretty much anyone else. But in my case, with the genetics I have, the chemistry that I have, that would right. be necessary, but not sufficient. Right. So I also need a medication. We didn't know that till later. And it took me a long time to accept it. You just said something that I want to point out. And I think it's so important. And part of the stigma that we want to remove today is the chemistry. A lot of people do not understand. They just think, oh, well, this is something you can get over. This right. is actual brain chemistry that is altered just enough to trigger behaviors. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's genetics that leads. It's interesting, Danielle, because now I'm working on this documentary film yeah. that's science based with a cutting edge science, a science documentarian from Nova working with me, wonderful director, Bonnie Walsh. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of research with the top scientists around the world, which is yeah. a huge privilege. So there's lots of theories of how it's happening. Well, some people say brain chemistry. Others would say, well, we know that circ circadian rhythms impact. Right. Um, chondria impacts, microbiome impacts, inflammation, and brain mm -hmm. circuitry. It's complicated. It but is. Let's, but we know it's genetic. And we know that my opinion is, and most doctors will tell you, you're going to live with this forever. Yeah. Right. It's not going away. Right. Is that a problem in my case? No, I live a beautiful life. My mm -hmm. life is beautiful. Thank God. Right. My medication works. I have no side effects. You would not know 
if you did not know my story in the day to day that I live with a bipolar brain. And in terms of crushing the stigma, what's happened as a course of this film is that we are, the film was inspired by my memoir, but it's not only my story. So right. we are collecting, that's the wrong word, but other amazing people with bipolar and bipolar two, especially are going to be characters in this film, their life story, live, living care, real characters. So for example, I'll give you a few. One is Dr. David Kabushan. She came out in a LA Times op-ed last summer saying, I'm the acting surgeon general mm. of California, a big friggin' job. And right. I have bipolar. She did that to end the stigma. I found her, we met kindred spirits as a result of that very high platform that she has as a Surgeon General and LA Times. A lot of people wrote to her like I did and said, me too. So now in the film, I'm looking over here because I have their pictures. Major General Greg Martin, bipolar, commanded 10,000 troops in Iraq. He's recently come out with his memoir. Um, his mission is to end the stigma and save lives. This guy commanded 10,000 troops, high functional, second two-star general. There's right. David, who was the Surgeon General. We have a young woman who was the youngest person in the Obama White House. We have someone who was a Shark Tank winner, the fastest ever Shark Tank entrepreneur winner, got a million dollars out of the gate, you know, and on and on. And so what I found, even though I thought that I was through with my stigma, I didn't realize how much of it I had still internalized. Mm -hmm. So as I started to meet these really cool people, I'm like, whoa, this is a good club to be part of. Right. You know, and you realize it turns out there's a lot of research and we've got researchers at UCSF and Cal Berkeley and others who are looking at the positive side of our genetics, which right. is increased creativity, increased entrepreneurialism, increased risk taking, increased joie de vivre. There's a lot of good qualities to it. I love that because there are a lot of great qualities. And I want to talk about the day that because we're going to continue the conversation about removing the stigma for you, the day that you finally received the diagnosis, what went through your mind? Was it a finally, or was it a, oh no, or what happened to you and for you in that moment? Yeah. I mean, for me, I think my, my story is probably not the typical story. Because I was like, finally, yeah. because why? My mother had been on lithium. Lithium worked for her. Mm -hmm. She would never accept the term bipolar because of the huge stigma. She was really right. depressed, but she couldn't say bipolar. But I had done a research paper as a young person where I found out that if lithium works for you, you are bipolar, some form of bipolar, most likely. So after the fifth psychiatrist, and I said to my sister, you know, of course, who's live through the same experience with my mom, Martha, don't you think I might be bipolar too? And this is what, when I was like devastated, like couldn't get out of bed. Right. She helped me find this doctor who was a bipolar expert, mm. Dr. Perlman out here in Western Massachusetts. And so when he finally said what happened with him, which was stunning, was that he diagnosed me in 10 minutes and five questions after 25 wow. years. Why? Because as I said earlier, he knew to look for bipolar too. And most people don't. Right. He used this diagnostic scale called the Bipolar Spectrum Diagnostic Scale, BSDS, Dr. Jim Phelps's. And, you know, five questions. He goes, OK, we know what you have. Don't worry. Stay the course. You're going to get better. And he was so clear about that. Elder, he'd been at it for 40 or 50 years. And right. the other thing, bless his heart, that he did that I wish every psychiatrist would do is he had open office hours nine to 10 every night. You could call. Mm. Him. So and I would say, I'm not getting better. WTF, you know, I don't trust yeah. you. Call him up. And he'd yeah. say, stay the course. We know what you have. Mm. And three months later, the light switch went back on and my brain was working. Amazing. Yeah. What a moment of gratification almost uh, to be able to say, I am getting better. I know what I have. Now let's do something kick ass with it. Yeah. Well, there's a, there was a gap between there and there. Of course. But, but of course. So I'm 46 when I get diagnosed finally. Mm -hmm. And the three month gap is because the medication I'm on, you have to titrate up very slowly. It's called Lamotrigine, also known as Lamictal. And years later, we added a little homeopathic dose of lithium. And that's my magic combo so far. Mm -hmm. I would, I was, you know, prayed one day at a time because this is with me. Right. But right. it's been good for many years so far. So it wasn't the on-off switch took three months. And when I say on-off, mm -hmm. if you look at my TED Talk, I take a lot of time to describe 
I want to help people try to understand what I say when I mean I have a broken brain. Mm. Because when most people think depressed, they think ah, you're sad or, you know, right. it's an emotion. I say it's not emotional first. It's a physical thing. It's a brain thing. Right. Example, I can't do dishes. Not that I don't want to. I literally can't do them. Mm-hmm. I can't do laundry, for, uh, fold, sort, put away, too complicated. If I go to the grocery store and there's three kinds of peanut butters, I am completely paralyzed, trying to fig- paralyzed, right. trying to figure out which peanut butter. So the brain literally doesn't work. It's dramatic. Mm-hmm. So, and, you know, I'm a navigator. I can't navigate. I There's also a huge memory thing where, like, I wouldn't remember word recall. I couldn't do words. And memory is tough. So at that three month mark point, I was out with a bunch of girlfriends. We always do a paddling trip every summer. Mm-hmm. They practically have to pack for me because I can't pack because I can't figure out, a, you know, which clothes I need. But that trip, I remember like, like it was, oh, I'm navigating again. I'm the person mm-hmm. who knows the map. Then I wanted to go out by myself for a sunset paddle. That's good. Then we we're playing this silly memory game, like a mm-hmm. super silly one in the tent. And I won. Mm. best girlfriend starts crying tears coming down her face going you're back because I was Mm. laughing and I won the memory game and I and I was and it was like boom so that's the story of of the getting the right medications Mm. and so yes I was thrilled at that diagnosis at that point and I had a number of elders in my life telling me you know you've done nothing wrong there's nothing to be ashamed of this is genetic this is physical get help you deserve it right beautiful I actually started to tear up because it is so important to be able to hand over the skill set, the medication, the the tools, everything in order to help somebody live their most productive, healthiest, grounded, most beautiful experience while on this earth. Yeah. So for you to be able to have that is so empowering and so beautiful. Mm-hmm. And now you're using that for the benefit of others. Let's talk about the broken brain, because that is something that is so internalized by so many people. It doesn't matter whether it is bipolar or it's any mental health or it's trauma. That stamp of I am broken is a stigma of its own. Can mm-hmm. you talk about that? Let's see the stigma part. I mean, the functional part. Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. I'll give, I can give you a little story. It's out of the book. So my kids are like three or four and I'm desperately trying to give them a normal life, which is pretty impossible because I can't figure out how to get the soccer cleats together for four-year-old soccer, you know. Right. But one of our friends had invited us again. It's camping. It's the summer. And, and these friends do everything. They roll out the red carpet. They get all the gear. They get all the food. They get all the ice. They get all the tents. All you have to do is show up, right? right. And that's going to be hard enough because I won't be able to find my way there because it's a new place, right? And I got to have to figure out how to get kids dressed and how to get them packed. And that's overwhelming as it is. My husband's working somewhere else um, in another city. So, but I want to do it for the kids because I'm I'm trying to get them time with their friends and I don't want them to live in bipolar hell, right? So I agree to do it. On the way, my friend calls and he's got everything else, right? And he said, hey, could you pick up a bottle opener for the beer? We don't have one, Mm. right? And I'm giving chills now telling you this. My brain was going, then I can't go because wow. it's too overwhelming for me to figure yeah. out how to stop in a new store and find the freaking bottle opener. Right. But I'm feeling so much shame because how do I tell David after everything he's doing that? No, I can't pick up the bottle opener because I'm mm-hmm. still not quote out of the closet. I'm still closeted and in shame. So I'm not telling my friends I'm telling some, but not more people who aren't completely in the inner circle. Right. So in that moment, stigma, shame. My brain's broken. I can't find the bottle opener. And I can't even figure out how to tell these friends. I ended up telling him, no, I can't get the bottle opener. And I had so much shame, but because he's going to think what's wrong with this person? You know, he didn't know. What was the response? I think he was just confused. He was like, oh, well, okay. You know, I'll ask Mary Beth to get it. Right. You know, but it was just in that moment it, for me, so difficult to say no to picking mm-hmm. up the bottle. It's a tiny example, but just right. to your question about the broken brain and mm-hmm. sense of shame and uh, it's everywhere. I mean, and even you don't, in my case, I don't physically look that different when I'm depressed and my brain is broken. So mm-hmm. I can show up at a gathering, but the experience inside my brain is excruciating. Right. I feel isolated. I feel alone. I can't connect. Nothing's funny. It's hard to smile. I don't want to be there, but then I don't want to be alone. You know, it's 
it's a constant excruciating experience. Let's talk about that for just a moment, because what you just described for many people, they'll say, well, I just have social anxiety. Mm -hmm. Where's the tipping point? Uh, I don't know. I'd probably have to ask you that, Danielle, as you're the expert. (laughs) For me, it's going to be different than those people. I I have bipolar too. So I don't have social anxiety when I'm well. Which means right. either I'm I'm my my medications and my practices are working so I'm balanced and then I love people I'm an extrovert, right? I drive my husband crazy because he's an introvert and he doesn't want to go anywhere. I don't live with my baseline health. I don't live with social anxiety. Right. It, I am completely anxious when when I say my bipolar is flaring when when that depressive bipolar experience is happening, which last has lasted in the past for months. Mm-hmm. So the difference would be for anybody listening that is identifying with that and they're thinking, oh gosh, you know, maybe I do need to examine this a little bit further is that that constant is always there and you have no way to kind of get back to groundedness. Right. So just think about that, right? So if this is going on for months and there's nothing that you can mm -hmm. do, I've, I've talked about this. If you're having excruciating depression and nothing is working. Right. And your brain is broken and you feel completely hopeless and, you know, you wish you could leave the planet, but you're afraid to do that. You don't want to leave your kids behind or right. with that stigma. And, you know, consider that you may be on the bipolar spectrum. Right. And I want you to realize for everyone listening, you know, just having a diagnosis or having what so many people now call a label does not actually have to define the way that you show up in your life, which is exactly why I wanted to talk to you, Sarah, was because so many people get these labels and they live and die by the label. It is the definition of every single thing and therefore it becomes the stigma. Yeah. And you are the living example of, we don't have to be a label. Yeah, and the semantics are huge. Right. And people in my world now, like the, there's a guy, Paul English, he was the founder of the kayak app, you know, the travel app. Yeah. He, he sold it for $1 billion with a B. You talk wow. about financial and yeah. he's bipolar. So he started something called the Bipolar Social Club, which is a listserv where we email each other. It's been great. Uh, lots of everybody on it has some form of bipolar. The, the semantics are really important. So instead of, I was for a while since this diagnosis, I never say I'm bipolar. Right. I'm not bipolar. You know, I'm I'm an athlete, I'm a mom, I'm a, a community mm. member, I'm a leader, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a bipolar. Right. I am living with a bipolar brain, is what I say. Right. Or I'm living with bipolar. Some people say they're living with bipolar disorder. That's the normal oh. term. I don't like disorder, so I usually leave it off. So I'm hearing this more and more. We either in the field now, we either, either call ourselves living with bipolar mm-hmm. or in the conference I was just at with professional psychiatrists, psychologists, et cetera, et cetera. They will refer to us as people with lived experience. I love that. love that. Yeah. Because love they're that. honoring the experience of the person who has lived through this where they're just studied it, right? They're mm-hmm. fabulous. They're helping us. But so I've now I've been a, a living with bipolar. I'm a person with lived experience. I was on a panel once with two psychiatrists and they called me expert by experience. Exactly. That's even better. Yeah. So I think the semantics are really important. Yeah. Take that label off. It's not, it does, it's not an equal sign. It's not who we are. Right. The the important, I think the important caveat on the other side is for me, it's very, it's been very helpful to name it and claim it because that's how I get better. So not like I'm saying be in denial. I'm saying, yes, I have bipolar diagnosis and I'm going to wave that flag because I want you to know. And if you've got, I want you to feel, I I want you to see that this is also the face of bipolar. Right. right? And um, a nice middle-aged lady who's living good life, you know, with kids and et cetera. One of the most beautiful things that you're doing out in the world between your book, TED Talk, the film, is teaching people how to connect and communicate with those people in their lives that may also have or living with the experience of bipolar. What can we do as friends, family members, caretakers to make everyone feel seen, heard, and allow their experience to be what it is without us trying to manage it for them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, and thank you for asking that, Danielle, because I had, when I first came out with the book, a lot of people would say to me, oh my God, I feel so guilty. I didn't know about me, my friends. Or other folks would say, I'm like deer in headlights. My cousin has this. I don't know what to do. What Mm -hmm. can I do? You know, how can I help? Or 
So I came up with, I call it the your EMT emergency mental health team toolkit. Mm. Okay. And it's only four things. And the first one is show up, right? Don't expect them to reach out. You have to reach in. They won't mm-hmm. call you, right? So you have to knock on the door. You have to make the phone call, not even the text. You have to be proactive. Why? I'll even make that mistake with friends of mine who are depressed. I'll say, I'm here for you if you need me. They're never going to call. No. Because never. on that end, on the depressed end, you feel too much shame. You mm-hmm. think that your friends don't want to be around you. You think you're a burden. You think all this stuff. So on the ally end of this thing, you must reach in. Don't right. expect them to reach out. That's one. Number two is this thing you were just alluding to, which is listen without judgment or trying to fix it, right? right? You want to fix it? You can't. Right. The best thing you can do is just be present and accompany this person. Mm-hmm. You know, They feel alone on this island of shame and despair. And just you're showing up as a lifeline. Right. You know, so and get them out, right? So knock on the door, take them for a walk and just be present. Don't try to fix it, which is hard for people like me who want to come up with a solution. And then the third thing I say, for those of you who do want to do something, please understand about this broken brain. You don't see it in a cancer victim. You bring food. You know, Mm -hmm. when somebody broke their leg, you would get the kids to their appointment. This person effectively has a broken leg. They have a broken brain. They cannot choose the peanut butters. So they won't make the phone call to the doctor because they lost the number and they don't know where it went. Right. So the the little things that you think are so obvious that anyone could do, you do them. Show right. up, do the dishes, fill the freezer, take the kids to the appointments, call the doctor, fold the laundry, do those little things, okay? Mm-hmm. Because they won't be able to do them for themselves. Right. You can't tell that they have a broken brain. They look normal like I do right now, but they do. So you have to help. Right. Imagine broken leg. And then the fourth thing is you got to get support. Mm-hmm. You're going to need a posse. Because this is too much for any one person, you'll burn out. So you got to call in the posse, you know, of its friends, its family, its neighbors, its whatever, explain what's going on. In my case, I'm very blessed to have a women's circle. Listeners, get one. So yeah. we've been in circle for years already by the time I had my diagnosis. One of them got on point, was champion, and you basically set up the spreadsheet with who was going to show up when. When Once they knew it, it, what happened with her, her name's also Sarah. She was visiting me in Florida and trying to do some good, you know, like problem solving. And we were on a phone with a doctor and she saw that between this room and that room, from my room to going to the fridge, Mm -hmm. I could not remember the doctor's name. I could not remember his Mm -hmm. phone number. And I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. And she looked at me and she goes, oh, my God, I didn't realize it was this bad. So then she got the posse together. I'm getting chills saying this. That was just critical because I could not have done it by myself. I call those people in our lives the light because they really do hold our hands and it doesn't matter in what situation, but it's those people that step up and say, I've got you take Mm -hmm. my hand. I know that what you're experiencing is not under your control. I'm going to do whatever I can to be your support. And you're right. It does take an absolute village when we get into those spaces. It's a village and the village can even determine like, let's say you're my husband. He's not the one that wants to just listen. He wants to get shit done, right? right. So put them on the getting sh- stuff done, right? You yeah. know, do the laundry, fill the freezer. Somebody else is not such a great cook. She wants to just stand there and listen to right. you and go for a walk. Great. Do, have her do that. So if you've got somebody on point, they can kind of also yeah. assign jobs. But that's the main, those are the things. And those will be super helpful. Yeah. I hear the people that are listening, writing in saying, okay, but what am I looking for? If I have not been told that there is a diagnosis or maybe there isn't one yet, what is it that I'm looking for? And when do I know to ask, are you okay? Yeah, really good question. Because if your friend's not going to tell you, yeah, then that's difficult. I, I mean, I'm the person who's going to tell people of my inner circle. Yeah. Um, but if they're not going to tell you, it could be more difficult. Ask the spouse or the partner or the roommate. Mm-hmm. They're going to know. And that would be, you know, is this person not getting out of bed? Is this person not able to make themselves food? Is this person not doing the exercise they used to do? Is this person not making phone calls? Are they not showing up? Those are all the signs of depression. Then I think once you sort of are keyed into that, you'll know. And then you could ask. Hopefully they'll tell you. On the other end, if it is uh, bipolar and you're seeing some, there's mania, which is more obvious. Right. Way high and way low. But there's also something called hypomania. And the hypomania, which isn't as obvious, we've learned recently through the film is that some of the doctors diagnose that, but what they call the four A's, 
right? Which is agitation, anxiety, anger, and attention challenges. So if you see somebody who having all those, plus they've been depressed, Mm -hmm. that could be a good sign of bipolar two or bipolar without extreme mania. In retrospect, my husband could report that. Wow, you had a much after they gave me the wrong drugs, the antidepressants, mm-hmm. and my temper started to trigger, and I never had that temper before. Right. So we so. have to, yeah, I think that's so important just to kind of have some sense of awareness. And for all of the armchair psychologists out there, yeah, <laughs> don't try to don't diagnose. Try to diagnose. Exactly. Don't, don't try yeah. to diagnose exactly. Yeah, but and get some help then. Right. And, and I think you can. What you can do, because particularly like the partners, if somebody's seeing a psychiatrist or therapist or or primary care physician, that person's seeing them for 10 minutes or 50, right? Yeah. The the partner is seeing them 24 hours. That's right. So I think part of the book too is if the partner can go in armed with more information, Mm -hmm. give to that clinician or the diagnostician. And I give you an example of that if you want. Absolutely. So uh, this to me is a beautiful story. Remember, I had my first breakdown when I was 21. Yeah. Part of the purpose of this book is save kids 25 years of horror or worse, you know, right. because of suicidal rate and people with bipolar is twice that of pers- people with regular depression. So my son at this point, he's 18. Uh, he's about to go off to college during during COVID. Mm-hmm. And he decides to read my memoir. And he's, you know, I'm like, okay, I think he's old enough to do this now. And I see him in the bed flipping the pages, like can't put it down. And he's like, mom's right. first book I read since middle school. And I'm oh. thinking, why did we send you that fancy high school? <laughs> what were you doing in the high school years? But anyway, he oh. couldn't put it down. So he read it. He goes off to college. It's a couple months in. And he said, overnight me your memoir. I think my new best friend, Jamie, might have what you have. Wow. Right? So Sam knew to look for it now, which was, you know, the high energy and then the crash. I sent him a book, Jamie, who is a wonderful human being. And I can say, because he's going to be in the film and he's on the back of the book, gave us a testimonial. Mm. He, and he's this tall, strapping, handsome guy. And I end up meeting him seven months later because we couldn't travel because of COVID. Right. We sat for two hours and he said, by page three, I was in tears. Finally, someone understood what it was like inside my brain. Mm. And then he and his mom and his mom, because they're British. Yeah. Uh, she describes me after that. I met her for the first time. I think British stoic. She throws her arms around me, starts crying. You saved my son's life. Mm. So they took the book. This is the connection to their mm-hmm. doctor. On page 17, I think I have this. On page 80, I think I have this. Will you please diagnose for bipolar? Which right. typically a doctor wouldn't do. Right. And there's simple diagnostics out there if you know what to look for. Right. Beautiful. Beautiful. Let's talk more about the book. We talked in the very beginning about sort of the protocol that you've put together. But let's take that journey through the book. If somebody is questioning, you know, this does sound like me, but I don't really know. And perhaps I'm a little scared to go to my doctor right now. What is the experience that they would get once they open that cover? Most people say they can't put it down. Mm-hmm. And that's not not just my, my friends and family speaking, right. folks who I've never met before. I've gotten emails now from Aust- Austria and Singapore. It's pretty wonderful. Mm-hmm. Can't put it down. It's it's a memoir. It's, it's written to to feel like a novel, right? right. So it's, I tell a story, and you get in the you get in the beginning, and you ride the wave of the story. And this was also a credit to my editor Jennifer Margulies because I just wanted to write the bipolar story. She said no one can read that. T- show them who you are as a human being, so mm-hmm. you get this human being story. And apparently, it's pretty compelling. I do have some major testimonials from, from big bipolar docs, which got me it was part of my inspiration to go ahead and publish it. But the first, you know, most of this book is the story. And then the last part two, I put in practices for healthy brain. I put in an interview with Dr. Phelps, bipolar expert. I put in bipolar pride. I put in other resources. So there's so there's this memoir, which is the story, which is going to compel you. And then there's the the how-to kind of resource section. And then if you go to my website, which is sarahschley.com, it's about like my name and you'll have it in the notes probably. One of my friends said, if people find you, they're going to be in trouble. You need a resource page. Yeah. So I did create a resource page on there, which has a lot of other, you know, uh, places to go to, psycheducation.org, CRESPD, 
988 is the National Suicide Hotline, but a lot of great resources if you want to learn more about the bipolar spectrum. Let's talk about two things that you just mentioned, and we will absolutely link the book and all of the website, everything in our show notes. So make sure you go there if now you're wondering if it's for you or someone else. You know, education and knowledge is the way that we make changes. So Let go of the stigma. Make sure that you know that there are people who want to connect and help you, whether Mm -hmm. personally or for someone else. You mentioned healthy practices for the brain, which we talk about brain health and science here all day long on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned bipolar pride. Let's first start with the healthy practices. What are they for you? And kind of let's go through those. Okay. And please remind me to talk about the bipolar diagnostic scale because that's yes. available on the open open source. So we'll talk about that too. So healthy practices, I, I guess for your listeners, Danielle, this won't be new, right. but I made an acronym called PEX, which is Flex Your PEX Practices for Healthy Brain. And yeah. PEX stands for physical, emotional, creative, and spiritual. Can you yeah. tell I used to be a consultant because everything is fours? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and right? Everybody's used to the five here, yeah, right? So the mental, mental, financial, yeah. which is great, but physical, emotional, creative, and spiritual. So, you know, I I used to be part of my, you know, bipolar constitution, part of the family of origin I came from, driven, 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 right? right? And and that was my lit- litmus was just go and achieve. And now my litmus is more balance, right? I look for balance and balance is, so I look in the beginning of my day when I'm doing my spiritual practice, I'm looking for where am I getting physical, emotional, creative, and spiritual in my day. Absolutely. And if it's not happening, then I got to find a place for it. it. So double click on physical, that's exercise. That's what I call renewal, which is meditation or a nap. Power nap is key. Mm-hmm. Nutrition, that's a food part. Right. So I'm looking for, you know, oh, you know, I'm going to be out and about from five to seven. Where can I get my 20 minute power nap? Mm-hmm. Maybe I need to bring a blanket in the car or something. I, I like, I know I have to get that rest time. Same thing with nutrition. Oh, I'm not going to, there's no place healthy to stop here. You know, let me make sure I pack the low carb, high protein lunch. You know, Right. right. <laughs> so that, and the physical is like, I always have to get aerobic. I mentioned to you, I went for a swim this morning. First thing I always do either swim or hike or something. I got to get aerobic. Right. And then I do yoga and yoga for me with my, again, personality and chemistry and genetics and family is very important for calming. Mm-hmm. I just got to chill myself right down because I could go right up into rev mode. Yeah. So I've learned I do not pass go, you know, I brush my teeth and then it's my yoga mat. And luckily, I think if you can to make a little space where that always is that, you know, yeah. to return to in your space. So that's on physical, emotional, socials, you know, fine, get out with friends, not Facebook friends, real friends. Right. Real people. And this is why, so you can be efficient. You can put physical and emotional together by having a date with a buddy to go for a walk. Right. I do a lot of walk buddy dates or hike or swim or whatever. Creative is anything that's getting you out of your left brain. So it's, you know, it might be drawing, painting, cooking, singing, right? Writing. I'm a writer. Mm-hmm. Whatever you do that that helps you you know, be more expansive. Right. And then spiritual, of course, I don't want to prescribe any particular spiritual path and all of ours are different. Right. But for me, it's like unplug from what we're doing right now, technology, plug back in with nature, you know, right. so get outside and then do whatever you can to be expansive. Maybe you're meditating, maybe you're praying, maybe you're any of those. Whatever it is that you connect to that allows yes. you to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Absolutely. Part of something yeah. bigger than yourself. Yes. And yeah. unplugging is really important. For our so brain. important. It doesn't matter what we have going on. Normal brain, broken brain, we have yeah. to unplug because yeah. that technology, that constant stimulation is absolute, terribly you know, devastating on the brain on the long term. So we really do have to unplug. And by the way, that's after 10 o'clock and nine o'clock at night, no screens. Yep. Without amber glasses to reduce the blue light. If you don't have the amber glasses, the blue light gets in. It won't let your brain come up with mm-hmm. melatonin to tell you to go to sleep. Yeah. We recently had a neurologist on. We were talking about that exact same thing. Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely necessary in order to keep our rhythms correct in our body. We have to yep. do that. Let's talk about the diagnostic test first, and then let's go to the bipolar pride. I think that's so important. And let's talk about the test. 
Okay. Thanks, Danielle. You've got a good memory. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned before, my doctor that was able to diagnose me in four questions, knowing what to look for. So the bipolar spectrum diagnostic scale, there are other scales um, like that mood check. They're in the open forum. You mentioned before that you don't want to be an armchair psychi- psychologist, but you can take those tests and bring them right. to your doctor. Absolutely. The diagnostic of bipolar two or the bipolar spectrum disease. And I think it's really key because primary care physicians don't know. Right. They're writing 80% of the SSRI, the antidepressant scripts. They have no psychiatric training, God bless right. them. And they're getting it wrong a fair amount mm-hmm. of the time. So you can bring that like Jamie's mom, Claire, did to her doctor. On my website, there's a link from the resources page. There's a link straight to those bipolar spectrum diagnostic scales. And you can take the test. So again, those are in the open source. I think they're really important. First and foremost, I want everyone to remember, all of us are only limited by our own exposure and our training. So if we have not been exposed or we have not done the research or had the training We're only limited by what we're willing to look up, what we're willing to investigate, what we've been trained in. And so if we don't go in fully armed, we're only going to be meeting that person, that that prescriber based on their experience. That's so important to understand. So be armed. Yes. Right. Be armed. This is not to be, there's no disparaging of primary care docs. They no. do the best they can, but they get right. they get one month. My niece right. just went through it. She's uh, six years of um, med school and two years of residency. One month right. of psychiatry as a primary care doc. And most, the vast majority of psychiatric concerns start in the primary care doctor's office because right. people can't find psychiatrists or there's a stigma they don't want to go. Right. So yeah, you, if, your guy, if your guy or gal is open, and hopefully they are, mm-hmm. Because they don't have expertise in this. Right. Bring them the scale and say, hey, you know, I'm concerned. Or, man, we could go on and on, Danielle, because this is huge for postpartum moms. It is. One out of five postpartum moms are going to be depressed. And one out of four of those could be bipolar depressed. Right. Most OBGYNs don't notice to screen for that, although some are now. So that's also really important out there. If you're having a hard time, consider that this may be a bipolar postpartum trigger. And what's so important in that too, just like you said, you know, everything was great until I hit 21. What we're finding, and I'm I'm sure you have heard this as well or have done the research, is that there's often an activating event, and yet sometimes we're unaware of the activation. And so things like birth. Yes. Massively triggering. Yeah. Hormonal changes. Right. Yeah. Birth can be, unfortunately, the first time that someone experiences this and they don't know it hits, hit them. And again, postpartum depression is now, there's been a huge amount of work to destigmatize that. Right. Because moms would never go to say anything because they were all supposed to be bucolic, right? And right. Missed out. And we're not. One fourth of us are, you know, suicidal. A good percentage is bipolar. So get help, get screened. If your OBGYN isn't familiar, hopefully they are. More increasingly, they are. And right. Bring the book or bring some, bring, bring the diagnostic skill. So are we talking about pride now? Let's talk about pride and let's talk about your film. I'm excited about oh, that. Yeah, the film and then, is super exciting. Yeah. And then we'll all give right. all the resources too, but let's okay. talk about pride. All right. So first I have to say with all respect to our LGBTQIA plus friends, because I don't want to co-opt the term, but, right. for, but friends have said, it's okay. You can say it right. Um, because Pride is a word in the lexicon. So I talk about bipolar pride because of this huge stigma. Mm-hmm. What happened for me? My editor that I mentioned previously, I'm going, I'm working on this book. You know, it's on, it's like 15th draft and it's really ready, but I still can't press send because mm-hmm. I still have some internal stigma. I'm like, am I really ready to come out with a story? My clients yeah. don't have a clue, you know, can I do this? So she gave me an assignment. She said, I want you to go home and write this. I am bipolar. In my case, I would say I'm living with bipolar. Mm. And I'm a better person because of it. Mm. So I took, I did the assignment. And once again, I came up with four things. Right. And at the end of writing that two page thing, I was ready to press send. So you want to hear the four things? Of course. So the first thing, I don't know if I'm in order, but the first one is like emotional fearlessness. Mm. There's nothing you can bring to me, Danielle, that my brain has not already put me through. Right. I am a friend that is going to go to hell and back with you. And I will not leave you and I will not judge you. 
Mm-hmm. The first thing is emotional fearlessness. The second one is that is non-judgment and compassion because, you know, there, but for the grace of God, I could be in the streets. I could be in jail. I could, I could be addicted. I could be homeless easy if I didn't have the family that I had. Right. So I will not judge you. I do not judge you for your addictions. I am not judging anybody. Right. Because who knows there, but for grace of God. Second, the third one is that I have gained a lot of expertise in my practices for healthy brains. So very disciplined. Right. And people will tell me, you're my North Star on, on self-care. Why, how do you do, why do you do it? And I'm like, well, if you knew what was on the other side of this for me. Right. But it turns out I'm inspiring for my friends with my discipline. I can help. And the last one is this like most days off the charts gratitude. Mm-hmm. You know, because when you've been to hell and back and you've lived in that place of suicidal ideation for months, if not years, and you've been in the broken brain world and you don't think you're ever going to be able to climb out, right. you know, then every day with a brain that's working is a miracle. Right. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. And so you're grateful. And that gratitude can be contagious. Right. right? So yeah. those are things to be proud of. There's probably more, but you know, it's this Phoenix from the ashes that, you know, we have developed these qualities of character and soul, you know, that you've been forged through the gauntlet of, you know, brutality. Right. Uh, So I have a lot of pride now. And I have also, because I've met these other people that are all have been on this journey and they're just Mm -hmm. rock stars. I love them. You know, that sense of knowing that we're not alone gives us that ability to bridge ourselves from our experience to a community. Mm -hmm. And that makes all of the difference in the world with the gratitude, with the understanding of the self-care practice of really getting to a space of owning who you are, Mm -hmm. not because you feel shame or guilt, but because you very much know that your experience is your experience and there's something beautiful within it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't wish it on anybody, but having been there, been through it, it's yeah, there's, it's, it's tremendous. And there's, there's a lot of pride in being a survivor Yeah, you know, and being just doing it one day at a time. Absolutely. Where can people get your book and when will this film be finished so that we can all have a better understanding of the beautiful souls in this community. Amen. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you first about the book, Brainstorm from Broken to Blessed in the Bipolar Spectrum. You can get it on my website, which is the same as my name, sarahschley.com. And, uh, or you can get it anywhere that you get your your books. It's audio, ebook, softcover, hardcover on Amazon or anywhere else you like to get your books. Mm-hmm. If you go to my website, you can also support your local bookstore and purchase it there. So it's widely available. So the film you know, this could be a whole other podcast, Daniela. Maybe you'll invite me and my director back on again. I would love to. And producer, because Absolutely. this is really a whole other hour. But just to kind of, you know, sneak peek, tease is that dear friend and brilliant science, award winning science documentarian, Bonnie Walsh, her Emmy award winning producer, Melanie Wallace from Nova for 40 years. I'm going to speed up on this. But at first they said, mm, bipolar has been done. But then they read the book. They saw the TED Talk. They listened to the book. And they said, no, this is a story that we have to do. Mm-hmm. So long story, much shorter. We've had some miraculous stuff happen around funding. Though we're happy to take more funding if anybody wants. And it's, get my poster for it. So its mission is end the stigma, save lives, and maximize healing. Mm-hmm. What we're doing that's different is we're weaving compelling stories of people with lived experience, people living with bipolar, like I mentioned, the general, the surgeon general. We're weaving that with the cutting edge breakthrough science, truly leading scientists in the world mm-hmm. uh, and what they're learning about bipolar genetics, microbiome, uh, mm-hmm. mitochondria, et cetera, that we spoke about. So it's going to be that weave of science. And then we're ultimately our goal is you know, like I said, and the stigma, but also breakthrough treatments. So people who are right. living bipolar and their friends and family can make a difference in their own lives. Exciting. It's called Brainstorm right now. The, the website for that is brainstormthefilm.com. And that will show you who our experts are. We've interviewed who our team is, who our characters are, what our reason for being is. It's got the uh, sneak peek into the film. It's got my TED talk. So that's brainstorm the film and that spring of 25. Can't wait. I think that's such important work that you're doing. Before we wrap up, did we miss anything? Great question. Yeah, I just want people who are listening out there to know that you can live full, thriving, beautiful life. It's possible. Bipolar is very 
treatable if you know what you have. So feel good about the diagnosis. I tell parents, a lot of parents will tell me, oh, my kid is diagnosed by polio. I'll say, that's great news. Yeah. Because now we know what to do. You know, right. so it's very treatable. And yeah, just um, God bless. I do something here on the podcast that I find to be very interesting because what happens, no matter what we're talking about, there seems to be a universal theme when it comes to what I'm about to ask you. So we always end with your three gratitudes. Could you share with us three things that you are infinitely grateful for that really have changed your life, whether it's present or in the past, whatever it is, what are your three? Oh, thank you. That's such a great question. So many more than three. I know. <laughs> it's hard to narrow it I down. another book it? about gratitudes to tell you. <laughs> um, well, first has to be my health mm. because, you know, if I, it's like if mom ain't happy and nobody happy. So if I'm not healthy, then there's nothing that I can share or do with anybody. So my right. physical health, my emotional health, intellectual, and spiritual health, that would be one. Secondly, husband and kids, Joe, Sam, Maya, and, and Melanie, Sean, Lauren, all the grandkids, very super blessed with fabulous people in my life. And they just fill my heart every day. The, the twins are, they're twins, my two 21 year olds. They're, you know, both working and they're good friends and they're just beautiful. I love them. And so what's the third one? Third one, I will, I'm going to say four. One is because I'm just looking outside and I live in nature in a beautiful place. And I'm so blessed to live in a place with, you know, food and water and air that's that's healthy and restorative and i uh, one of the guys we interviewed one of the um scientists in uk says if you know that you got bipolar move to the country and get a dog (laughs) (laughs) i did that a long time ago not knowing so that's three and then there's also wonderful friends like yeah i'm gonna add a gratitude for you but from my perspective please it is that i'm thankful for your work Mm. for removing what could be the hide in the closet, keep it to yourself, don't do the great work that you're doing, but instead using your voice and your experience to help other people know this isn't a broken situation, but instead a beautiful place to build your life upon and to use your knowledge and your experience to not only benefit you, but for other people. And for that, I'm internally grateful because there are so many people who in their lives mm-hmm. who break up their families who mm. aren't open, who don't live their best experience because they're afraid and they're ashamed. So Sarah, thank you so much for doing the work that you do. I have great gratitude for that. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you for seeing that. It's a privilege and I'm grateful I get to do it too. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for your time today and for opening our eyes. And I hope that the women that are listening and the people that are listening hear that not broken, but able to live. Yes. Amen. From broken to blessed. Thank you, Danielle. So nice to meet you and chat with you. I appreciate your time. I sit in awe of Sarah and of course her journey. She is truly the definition of what it means to take circumstance and turn it into power. If you would like to connect with Sarah or purchase her book, her website is sarahschley.com. That's S-A-R-A-S-C-H-L-E-Y.com. You can also purchase her book at all major retailers, including Amazon. We'll be linking Brainstorm the Memoir here in the show notes. And you can also check out that upcoming film at brainstormthefilm.com or you can find it on Instagram at brainstormthefilm. If you believe you or someone else is in need of mental health evaluations, please do not delay. Help is always available and there are thousands of people like Sarah and myself doing the work to end the stigma of mental health and provide the tools and resources so that you may live a healthy and productive life. Thank you so much for listening to the Get Your Life Together Girl podcast. If you've enjoyed this conversation and tools for bettering your life and are seeking daily inspiration, you can follow me on social media at Get Your Life Together Girl on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Clapper, YouTube, and now Threads. You can also visit the show notes, my blog, and my website for additional resources at GetYourLifeTogetherGirl.com. Please feel free to share this episode with a friend or a family member as it helps spread this message for those who need it. And while you're doing so, please don't forget to review. 
I also want to invite you to check out my new 15 day affirmation course, where I take you on a journey through your brain chemistry and how to help you create your greatest desires. It's available right now on Insight Timer and soon to be unteachable. Until next time, be kind to yourself and others.